Welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm CEO Dan Mary Asher. Thanks for spending some time with us today. One brief reminder, check out our video interview series, Conversations with B'nai B'rith, on Facebook and on YouTube. You'll find discussions with historians, diplomats, Middle East experts, even an astronaut and an NFL player and a legendary DJ. And watch our latest content by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook at B'nai B'rith International. Well, advanced statistical analysis and big data have undoubtedly changed how baseball is managed, analyzed, and consumed. But impassioned fans and experts might argue whether that's been to the sport's advantage or to its detriment. Well, either way, the infusion of personalized data and analytics into baseball's uh, and America's pastime is upending long-held baseball wisdom in how to spot all-star talent, how to predict performance, and how much to pay players, and much more. Well, with me to break down all things baseball are Pesach Wilicki and Scott Kahn, hosts of the Baseball Rabbi Podcast, part of the new Jewish podcast network, Jewish Coffee House. Wilicki and Khan are experts in baseball history, reevaluating historical assumptions and applying advanced metrics to the grand old game. Pesach, Scott, welcome. Great to have you with us today. Thank you, Dan. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Well, the, the first question always is, how did you get started in this? Why did you decide to do this podcast? But in this particular case, uh, for both of you, uh, you have a background in, in Jewish education. Uh, you um, have been involved in uh, the uh, discussion of Jewish ethics uh, and all kinds of, of very interesting topics relating to the Jewish people and how we conduct our lives as Jews. But this is baseball. So how did you get into this podcast, Scott? Well, what happened really was that we had had a yeshiva together. That should be noted first. Pesach and I founded and ran a yeshiva called Yisodeh HaTorah in Israel in Beit Shemesh for post-high school students. After 11 years, the yeshiva closed down, and each of us went our separate ways looking for things to do. Pesach became involved in Jewish-Christian relations and dialogue, and I decided to go into uh, the idea of podcasting and online education, if you want to call it, or online entertainment or some combination. So I started a podcast network called Jewish Coffee House, and when I was thinking of what it would include, I wanted to send the message that religious Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, does not need to only be concerned with the direct text in front of us. There's also something that we can we can engage with the world, in other words. And part of that means dealing with pop culture, perhaps even dealing with it from a religious perspective, and sometimes as a matter of recreation as well. With that in mind, the very first podcast I thought about was something which I just called in my head. It was about five years ago I thought about it, Baseball Rabbi. I thought it was a nice double entendre. On the one hand, both of us are rabbis. But second of all, I thought of it more in the sense of rabbi implying a scholar, somebody who would look at it from a, a deep sabermetric approach, because Pesach, years earlier, had taught me about sabermetrics, advanced analytics. Base, baseball is a fascinating sport, but I had always been a traditionalist looking at it the way that most fans look at it. I grew up as a big Red Sox fan. But Pesach is a baseball savant. It's a different level entirely. So he really brought me into that world, and I thought that this podcast with Pesach would be amazing. At first, I didn't even think I would host it. I thought they would have a rotating series of hosts, perhaps, with Pesach as the anchor. Long story short, at first, Pesach didn't have time, but eventually he called me up and said, I think we should do it. And at that point, it changed a bit, and I became the co-host along with Pesach. We created this thing called Baseball Rabbi. And by then, it actually had changed the original format. It no longer was dealing with baseball, even from a Jewish perspective. It's entirely baseball now. The fact that we're Jewish is only indicated by the fact that rabbi is in the title, and we occasionally mention that we're recording in Israel. Other than that, though, it is a totally normal not Jewish at all, baseball podcast. So that's really how it started. And uh, I'm really happy we're doing it because it's a lot of fun. And I have learned a lot just from doing it and from uh, talking with Pesach every week. Pesach, your take on it. And you did work, uh, you have worked for many years uh, on Jewish Christian understanding, bringing people together. Um, sports is a way, and particularly baseball, is a way also of bringing people together. So uh, your take on uh, how you got into the Sports Rabbi podcast. Well, Scott had mentioned the idea to me, and as he as he mentioned, I didn't. I just said to him, "Yeah, that's a that's a cool idea," but I don't have time for this. Uh, baseball, uh, as you could imagine from what Scott just said, has been a long time has been a lifetime obsession of mine. 
uh, to the point that I'm actually not a sports fan uh, beyond baseball. I do not follow football. I do not follow basketball. I do not follow hockey. I think I've watched one Super Bowl almost by accident in the last 25 years. So, uh, but I, I am obsessed with baseball. I mean, my life really boils down to my family, of what I do for a living in Jewish Christian relations and, uh, and the Torah study that, you know, that, that fills other parts of my life and largely at this point has to do with my work and baseball. I mean, it's, it's really, it's a, it's, I would consider it more of a, uh, of a serious hobby than a fandom per se, uh, in my life. And this has been since I was a little kid. I mean, when I was, if you, if you were to meet Pesach Wiliki as a seven or eight year old, I was memorizing the backs of baseball cards and creating my own, you know, imagined realities. When as a child, I did not fantasize about playing in the major leagues. I fantasized about managing in the major leagues. I mean, that's the that's the type of kid that I was. But it's interesting that the Jewish you mentioned my work in Jewish Christian relations because when I finally called Scott and said, "Hey, let's give this a shot." It was after attending a double A game of the Corpus Christi Hooks, which is the Astros double A team uh, in Corpus Christi, Texas, with two pastors. Uh, after I, it was a Sunday, and uh, I, I was speaking in a church in Corpus Christi, uh, as I because I do that a lot. I travel around and uh, you know uh, and speak about Israel and and the importance of the Christian Jewish relationship in churches. And I had two churches to speak in on a certain Sunday in Corpus Christi, Texas. And one of them was in the morning and one of them was in the evening. And I looked at the schedule and I saw that the double A ball club, the, the Corpus Christi hooks were going to be in town that day. So uh, I, I mentioned to the pastor of the first church I was speaking at, I said, Hey, you know, are you a baseball fan? And he's like, yeah, I'm a huge baseball fan. I love, you know, we have a double A team here. I have season tickets. So I, I, I went with him and another pastor to the game and we're sitting at the game. And in the first inning, the pitcher uh, uh, for one of the teams based on what was going on in the count and which pitches he was throwing, I started kind, I started giving my own analysis to what was going to happen in the game. And, and, uh, and these, these two pastors who were sitting on either side of me, and I knew a lot of the players, even though they were double-A players, they were shocked that I was aware of certain, uh, certain things about some of these prospects. And as I'm giving my commentary, they're just like, wow, you know, you're saying things, you're giving insights into this that I don't usually get even when I'm listening to a game on the radio or on TV. You know, you should really, you should really do something with this. And then they started, and I was like, okay, you know, maybe there's something to this. Maybe, maybe all of this life of, of obsessing over something as meaningless as, as baseball should be, uh, you know, and, and, and all this data and analysis that's in my head uh, maybe there's something that I could do with it. Maybe it could benefit people and they could, it could entertain people and, uh, and it might be a fun thing to do. So, uh, when I got back from that trip, I remember I contacted Scott and this is, this is a few years ago and that's when we started it. Well, before we get into uh, rule changes and saber metrics, uh, I, I, there's a question that I wanted to ask, uh, both of you, what constitutes a baseball purist? And I say that thinking about all of the information that's come about because of these statistics and, and sabermetrics. Uh, when I was growing up, um, you know, I would pick up, uh, and I grew up in New England, but I, I picked up New York Yankee games uh, on our radio in the kitchen. And Mel Allen, Red Barber, uh, and Jerry Coleman at that time <clears throat> were the broadcast team for the Yankees. And I lived in, in New England, and we had Kurt Gowdy, who was broadcasting uh, with at that time Ned Martin and, and Mel Parnell. And there would be in between pitches, you know, there would be long periods of silence and you could hear the, the crowd noise and it was a summer night and it was something kind of um, a very special about that. But today, today, that that space between pitches is filled with all kinds of information about not only the one who's batting, but who's coming up next and uh, team statistics. And and sometimes I feel that there's there's kind of an overload. So how do you respond to that, Scott? Well, you asked to define a purist, and I'm, I guess you really, perhaps it's a semantic question, but I'll give you my answer to that question. I think there are two different types of baseball purists, one which I think is good and one which I think is incorrect. 
The baseball purist, which I think is an incorrect form of being purist, meaning I think it's misguided is a better way of putting it, is a baseball purist who denies that advanced statistics really help us understand the game better, who still thinks that saves, for example, is an accurate gauge of how well a reliever does in the ninth inning, or thinks that RBIs is a meaningful statistic the way that I did when I was five years old. That's a baseball purist who's ignoring the mathematical reality. We can see what things mean just by analyzing certain things. So to me, that's a baseball purist who might be looking or barking up the wrong tree. On the other hand, a baseball purist who prefers the game as it once was, who says, yes, I know that analytics have helped us do better in the game, help us decide, as you said correctly at the beginning, how much to pay a player, when to pay a player, perhaps having a starting pitcher only go five innings instead of going for a complete game. I know that works, but I liked it better the old way. That kind of baseball purist is someone I admire, and I'm probably in that camp too. I think that analytics have helped us understand baseball better. I think it's helped us or helped people involved in the game. I'm not exactly in the game. I have a podcast about baseball called Baseball Rabbi, but they'll help those in the game allow their teams to win or perform better. It doesn't mean it's made the game better. In fact, I think in a lot of ways, it's made the game a lot less entertaining. And that's evidenced by the way things have gone. This year, offense in baseball is as bad as it's been in the history of the game, including back in the early 1900s and even earlier. That's partially because of cheating on the part of pitchers. But as we stand today recording, the collective baseball batting average is 239. In 1968, the year of the pitcher, the lowest of all time was 238 at the end of the season. That's not an entertaining game. They had to change the rules. And a lot of that is because of analytics have enabled pitchers to get better and better and enabled managers and general managers to know how to use pitchers in ways which is more effective in winning, but making the game less fun. So in that sense, yeah, I think a baseball purist has it right. The game isn't as good. Maybe we have to find ways to make it more entertaining, despite the plethora of information we have now that we once didn't. I agree with everything Scott just said here, which I guess shouldn't be surprising. We, you know, we do share a, a lot of the same opinions. Um, in terms of the definition of a purist, I'm going to be a little bit more cynical. I think that generally when people say that they're a baseball purist, what they mean is I grew to love the game as a child and I want the game to be whatever it was when I was a child. Uh, it, so, uh, you know, and, and generally people who are baseball purists, um, who, what usually goes along with that is, is getting a little bit grumpy when there are changes. Um, whether they're actual rule changes or changes in the way the game is played or they're changes in the discourse and in the language and in the statistics that are emphasized. Uh, so baseball purists will get annoyed when people start talking about wins above replacement, war, and, uh, and more complicated statistics because they'll say, well, you know, I don't know what that is and no one can explain it to me. And, and, uh, and it, you know, it wasn't on the back of the baseball card when I was a kid. Uh, but, and they generally are turning a blind eye to the fact that baseball's always been changing. There were rule changes taking place. There's been rule changes taking place from the inception of baseball. So it's, uh, I really think that most purists, again, they just have a snapshot in their head of what baseball was like when they were a kid. And based on that snapshot, they want it to be that way forever after. Uh, so that's my take on the definition of a baseball purist. Well, uh, you're, you're right about the back of the baseball card. You know, I, um, I actually had to learn a lot of this myself. So it took me a long time as, a, as an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old to figure out exactly what AB meant. It took a long time or, or RBI. <laughs> I, just, I just saw numbers. And, um, and you're right. These kinds of advanced uh, statistics were, were not there. Well, given that data-driven analysis uh, from arm speed – to spin rate, launch angle, dominate today's game. What statistical categories <clears throat> for a season and a career do you think will be most affected by modern day rule changes for today's players? By the rule changes? Yeah. Okay, so I think the number one statistic, and this is a really simple one to get our heads around, that is most affected by rule changes, or let's, let's expand that a little bit if you don't mind not just rule changes, but changes really in the way the game is being played. Because you just brought up things like spin rates and launch angles. And I think the number one statistic that, 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 is, vit, that is difficult to evaluate um, going forward is strikeouts. And let me explain what I mean by that. Um, every single statistic has to be evaluated in its historical context if you really want to understand the true value. So let's, let's be honest with ourselves. We talk about a 300 hitter as being some sort of gold standard. Well, 
in 1929, in 1929, six, I'm sorry, 1930, in 1930, six out of the eight teams in the National League had team batting averages of over 300. Team, the entire team. The Philadelphia Phillies finished last. They had a team batting average of 303. They had three players on their team who hit over 390. They finished last. In 1968, the American League batting crown had uh, was some was was Carl Yastrzemski with a 301 batting average. He was the only player in the league who hit 300. So, if we're to be perfectly honest, when 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 um, when fans who have a traditionalist mindset and often and this is where it really uh, uh, breaks down, will say, well, Bill Dickey hit over 300 a number of times, and therefore he was a great hitter. Bill Dickey. Bill Dickey's prime took place during the greatest surge in batting average in baseball history. And that 300 batting average is really worth more like a 260 batting average in a normal time period. Uh, so there's, you know, it, context matters a lot. But generally, the reason that we don't have to worry so much about this issue is that is that throughout baseball history, there's been ups and downs with batting average, with home runs, with a lot of different statistics. There's been ups and downs. There's been low pitching eras, high, you know, uh, high, uh, uh, you know. There's been there's been eras like the like the mid 1990s where offense suddenly started surging again, and we kind of accept that as part of the ebb and flow. The problem with strikeouts is that the change in strikeout rates has been in one direction. It has never gone down. It goes up every single year. If you take a look at the percentage of plate appearances that end in a strikeout. It has been rising. It has never taken a step backwards. And we're talking 40, 50 years. I think there's one year where it dipped a tiny bit and then it continued. And especially in the last few years, it just rises and rises and rises. And the problem with that is when you get to a situation where someone like CC Sabathia, who just retired, retired just after getting his 3,000 strikeout, which is kind of in the same uh, range if we think about all time numbers as 3,000 hits. Every pitcher who's ever had 3,000 strikeouts. Is in the is in the Hall of Fame unless there's some mitigating reason why they're not there, like Roger Clemens. Three thousand strikeouts is a kind of gold standard. So when you have a statistic that is skewing in one direction, and and it's not heading it's not heading back. I mean, right now this season for the for the first time, the entire league is striking out more than once per inning, which used to be uh, this you know like people like Nolan Ryan would do that, and we'd all we, our jaws would drop because he was striking out more than one an inning. That's the league now. So that's a statistic that's actually losing its meaning. Another example of a statistic that's losing its meaning, but not because the, the game has changed, but because our knowledge has changed, is what Scott brought up earlier, where our analytics have, have changed the way we understand something. So the, the idea, for example, of, of, uh, of the save being a meaningful statistic. The save has always been an extremely flawed statistic, but people didn't really pay attention to it. They sort of accepted it. Oh, he saved the game. Um, but it doesn't actually describe something that took place on the field. Uh, because, For example, if the starting pitcher pitches a complete game and the final score is two to one and he wins, why doesn't he get a win and a save? I mean, he got the last three outs and then he got the, he pitched the ninth inning. He got the last three outs of a game that was close. He did the exact same thing that a relief pitcher coming in, pitching that inning would have done. Meaning at the reason, why doesn't he get a win and a save? The reason he doesn't is because he's the starting pitcher and that's the way that rule is written. Uh, it, it's a very strange rule and it has a lot of illogic in it. RBIs, RBIs are very context dependent. Uh, they're not actually a skill uh, in the sense that RBI percentage might be a more interesting statistic. What percentage of the runners on base does a guy drive in? But there was one year that uh, Joe Carter, it's one of my favorite statistics, Joe Carter uh, uh, played one season on the San Diego Padres and he drove in over 100 runs. Hitting in front of him that year were Tony Gwynn, Gary Sheffield, and Bip Roberts, who all were incredible at getting on base. It was an amazing offense that Padres team had. Joe Carter hit fourth. He drove in over 100 runs, but on the, in the entire major leagues, he had one of the lowest percentages of runners on base driven in of any player in baseball. So the question then becomes, was he a good RBI man? 
the traditional fan would say, well, he drove in over 100 runs. He's a good RBI man. But the fact is that if you took the average player in baseball and put him batting fourth on that Padres team, he would have driven in more runs. And that just illustrates the point of how meaningless that statistic is as a measure of skill. But for the first 75 years or so of baseball history, or maybe more, whoever led the league in RBIs would usually be the front runner for the MVP award. So, you know, there's things that we've learned because of how we analyze the game. But, but as I said about strikeouts, there's things that have actually been skewed uh, because of how the game is played. Another example, I'm not going to dwell on this. I'll turn it over to Scott would be wins for pitchers, pitchers. The way pitchers are used is so different now that it's not really an accurate gauge of their value. Yeah, Scott, just on that, I, Go ahead. And I have uh, I want to ask you about another rule change that uh, a lot of folks are talking about. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to comment one quick comment about when Pesach said that it's so much context driven. That's an interesting idea that analytics at times speaking about the romance of baseball. We talked about being a purist, how sometimes analytics can take away from that romance because you're seeing, you know, how the sausage gets made in a sense. You know, it's really going on behind the scenes. But on the other hand, at times, unlike the examples where Pesach was giving saves, RBIs, wins, where a 20-win pitcher, maybe it isn't as great as we thought, or 120 RBIs might not be so meaningful. On the other hand, sometimes analytics can help us say that what I saw actually was as good or even better than the statistics show. I'll give you an example. Ozzy Smith, when he played, was considered the best shortstop in baseball. Now that we have advanced analytics and we look back, we can say what we saw was real. He was even better than we thought. Another example that's close to my heart, Pesach mentioned Carly Stremski. As a little kid, he was my favorite player. In 1967, Carly Stremski won the Triple Crown. He was Sports Illustrated Sportsman of the Year. He was the MVP. And yet, if you look at his numbers, they were excellent. 320-something batting average, 120-something RBIs, 44 home runs. Terrific, but, you know, they're not the greatest numbers of all time. But with advanced analytics we can say, what was it that were people were seeing? Somehow everybody knew that Yaz was doing something really, really special. That that year was not just another great season, but something unique in the annals of baseball history. And with advanced analytics, we can look back, analyze other things that he was doing, whether it was getting on base, not in the context of, of a hit, like a walk, or his defensive metrics, and so on and so forth. And we say that year was actually one of the greatest years of all time. In fact, according to Baseball References War Measurement, wins above replacement, it was actually the greatest season in history, apart from someone named Babe Ruth. No one else has had a season that great in the history of hitting as he has. So in that sense, context allows us to say, you know what? Looking at the numbers doesn't tell the whole story. Analytics helps fill in the gaps, and it was even better than you thought. That's what I wanted to mention. Well, you know, there's, there's even something else about Yastrzemski, and we could, we could go off into that, but, but we won't, uh, other than to say that he was probably um, among the first, if not the first, uh, to really take off-season conditioning uh, seriously. Uh, and he would work out, the Red Sox trainer, they would work out, I think, in Linfield uh, at the country club there. And a lot was said about the fact that he really took the those months off very seriously. And that I'm sure helped with, with his career uh, statistics. I know they say that before 1967, he was very clear. The big difference between 1966 and 67 was that off season conditioning. He said he did it. He never did it again to that degree. He said, but he did it more than ever before. It's so interesting that you raised that point because one of the unique things about Yastrzemski's career for his era was his incredible longevity and durability. He, he, he was virtually never on the disabled list. I, I don't know. I, I could check that to make sure that he never was. But if I'm not mistaken, he, he actually played his whole career without missing time for injury. Uh, it's just uh, and, and maybe that has something to do with it. That's interesting. And, and think about the fact that he stepped in after season after Ted Williams uh, yeah. retired. Uh, now, a recent rule, a recent rule change that I think has drawn the ire of more traditional fans and those who embrace sabermetrics and new school approaches is putting a leadoff runner on second base in extra innings. Now, what was the goal of this rule change and how has it affected the game? You know, I think about, again, as kids, because we do relate to this as, as kids. And, you know, I think about rule changes sometimes that we see now, the kind of rule changes we made when we were kids. So, you know, the sun was going down. We were still playing. You know, we played on a field up the street that was. It was kind of on an incline. It was a big apple tree around first base. And, you know, somebody's mother would, would call the kids in. It was time for dinner. And you'd start, you know, making rule changes in order to see who, who could win the game. Uh, 
that I'm being somewhat, you know, yeah, two semi- strikes for an out. But, yeah, but I know. What, about, what about putting what about putting the runner on second base? Uh, who wants to take that one? I want to take it. OK, Beza. I, I think that rule is an abomination. And and it's uh, I'll, I'll say why I believe it's an ab- I I. In my opinion, it's an abomination, and at the same time, it's not accomplishing what it was meant. To, what the what the uh, wise men of Helm who run baseball thought it was going to uh, accomplish. So it's both ineffective and abominable, in my opinion. Uh, I'll, I believe it's, it's abominable to me because there there are other rule changes that are that have either been implemented or are being contemplated by baseball that. Whether they're misguided or they're or they're or they make sense, they don't uh, they don't actually strike at the heart of what baseball is and what a game is. For example, they, they, there's a new rule that if a that if a pitcher is brought in in a pitching change, he has to pitch to a minimum of three hitters. That's an interesting rule. The reason they said they were doing it was to save time. It doesn't save any time at all. It accomplishes zero of that. Uh, but I find it an interesting rule and it adds a certain strategic element to the game. Fine. It doesn't mess with what baseball is. One of the basic principles of baseball is that you have to earn your way on base. And having a player who's on base who then scores a run, and what in his stat line, there's a run scored where he never actually reached base. Not only did he not reach base, he wasn't a pinch runner. He didn't, no one reached base. And, and the, and, and this run is not is not charged to any pitcher. And and again, there's a player. Baseball is not it's not just the runs that are scored, but a run is a, is the result of players using their skills or messing up and, and reaching base. And then you reach base and then you and and each base is earned or or granted to you by the errors of the other team. But here's a base that is essentially like. From an accounting perspective, if you think about it that way, I have a moral problem with it. So, so there's that aspect of it. Now, if it was actually effective in doing what they wanted to do, then I, w- I could say, okay, you know, you know, maybe maybe there was some larger concern. And the reason that they implemented this, this was part of uh, Major League Baseball's uh, folly of tr- of, uh, of rule changes that were aimed at. Uh, speeding up the game. They have a problem with the pace of play. Now, there's two issues that Major League Baseball has somewhat conflated in their in their groping around in the dark. They've conflated the issue of the length of the games and the pace of the play. And those are not the same issue. They're obviously related to each other, but they're not the same issue. Uh, m- watching Major League Baseball today, there is much more time between pitches than there used to be. If you all you need to do is watch a video of a game from the 1970s, and you'll just see how quickly the pitcher delivers the ball each time after getting it back. How how much more rarely compared to today's game, batters are stepping out of the box. The game moves along at a swifter pace, and that makes it more entertaining. That. Uh, Length of the game is also an issue. The games have gotten much longer. Major League Baseball wanted to shorten the length of games, and and experiments in the minor leagues showed them that starting the extra innings with a runner on second means that there's less games that go into the 13th, 14th, 15th innings. The pro- What makes this whole thing misguided is that it's true that it does lessen the chance that a game goes deep. I was at a, a, a game in Minnesota about a week and a half ago that went to the 12th inning, even with this rule, so whatever. There's less games that go into those deep innings, but the, but what problem were they trying to solve? Is baseball's problem with pace of play or length of game, those occasional 15 inning games, is that what's turning people off of watching baseball? How many times a season does that even happen? So to, to avoid the possibility that there will be a 13 inning game or a 15 inning game, they implement a new rule. And the new rule doesn't shorten the games really in any in any measurable way because it only happens in extra innings. The real problem baseball has, which is pace of play, is completely unaffected by this. In fact, because pitchers all slow down even more when there's runners on base, they've actually instituted a rule that guarantees that starting from the first extra inning on, every pitch is going to be delivered at a much slower pace. So it did not accomplish anything that they meant it to accomplish. Um, 
So I think it's both ineffective and immoral. There you go. Scott, what do you, and would you also, I'm going to throw in another question here uh, too. Uh, how about the use of 18 inch bases in the minor leagues? Uh, what's, what's, what's the deal there? Uh, I don't have much to say about 18 inch base in the minor leagues. I don't know enough about it to comment on it, but I do want to just further what Pesach said one particular point where I will say, yeah, I think that in this particular case, you're messing up the traditional stats in ways which are really, really uh, annoying and frustrating. Someone gave this example. I don't remember who. Imagine a pitcher's pitching a perfect game and it's 0 0, and you go into the 10th inning, and then they start with a man on second. So the batter hits a sacrifice fly, one out, man advances to third, another sacrifice fly, runner scores, boom. The pitcher pitches a perfect game and loses. It doesn't make any sense. It just goes against the fundamentals of what, of what baseball is all about. Um, on the other hand, I kind of mentioned another rule, if you don't mind, which I think is actually very good. I don't know if Pesach will disagree with me. I happen to like the seven-inning doubleheader rule because I do think that an 18-inning doubleheader, I love baseball, but it goes on forever. And watching a doubleheader, it's like, oh, it's almost over, is actually kind of fun and it kind of changes the game in ways which yes change the nature of the game using that same example talking about a uh, perfect game in in not in seven innings is there such a thing if he throws a perfect game over seven innings what do we what do we even call it that i don't year. know but at the same time speeding up what it happened this year it's speeding up the game is uh, I, I like the idea of it so in that particular case i can I, I agree with it in terms of the basis rule i don't know anything about it so i can't really comment on it effectively yeah, but you know, Scott, if they solve the if they actually solve the pace of play issue, which they haven't done anything really to solve, length of game they're trying, but pace of play they haven't really solved. If they actually solve the pace of play issue, which they could solve easily, um, they then maybe these you wouldn't need these seven inning double headers because because all the games would be shorter. Hey, Sach, you're asking baseball to be intelligent about its rule <laughs> changes, and that's asking it to be something which it isn't. So you're asking baseball to become something which it's not. That's a good issue, and we can do that perhaps in the next program. But I want to move on to, to because we have a little bit of time left, another trend that's worth mentioning is that pitching speeds are significantly higher than they were 10 years ago. Now, could you move the mound back to 63 feet or so to give batters a fraction longer to see 100-mile-an-hour pitches? And, and let me talk about speed and um, durability. And one of my favorite pitchers of all time was Warren Spahn. And, and if you look at Spahn, these are, these are magnificent statistics in terms of complete games and shutouts, not to mention 363 career wins. And he had a great deal of uh, not only durability, but longevity, pitched for a long time. Um, what about the speed issue? Um, does, that, does that all come back to, we're going to put this guy in for five innings and just have him throw everything he has? I mean, where does this all come together? I think that, yes, yes and no. I think that moving the mound back, maybe to 61 feet, 62 feet, I don't know how much. They probably have to experiment in some independent leagues to decide what's the right amount. That definitely is a possibility, and it should help. But I'm not ready to go there yet. As many people know, one of the big issues in baseball right now is the fact of pitchers cheating by putting sticky stuff on their hands or on the ball. And that seems to be a very serious uh, element of what's going on. Whether that only affects spin rate or speed, a lot of the benefits that pitchers have right now can be attributed to somewhat the equivalent of what batters got when they took steroids. That's very likely. If baseball is effective in its crackdown and is able to have pitchers stop doing that, it might be that the issue will resolve on its own accord. And whether it means that the ball will be thrown not quite as fast or whether it simply will move a little bit less, thereby enabling hitters to hit the ball. Because of course, if pitchers are getting better, it stands to reason the hitters are getting better too. So I'm not quite sure that it's impossible that an Aaron Judge or a Mookie Betts can't hit a fast ball like that. Maybe these hitters are doing things which Ted Williams simply couldn't do. They're getting better too. So I am willing, and I'm totally willing to entertain the possibility of moving the mound back. But at the same time, I'd uh, like to first see what happens once we find out how players are playing without cheating. It's almost like if they had instituted rule changes in 2002 because of all the home runs being hit by people on steroids, it would have been misguided. I think that, uh, you know, first of all, this issue of velocity is I don't believe it's driven by the sticky stuff. It's, it might be driven somewhat because pitchers have so much more control over the ball that they can throw it harder. Cause if you think if you throw a ball as hard as you possibly can, you're going to lose accuracy to throw a ball, both accurately and hard. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it's helping them, but I, I think that the advances in velocity 
are really due to a, a side of what we, what we might call analytics or technology in baseball that fans aren't really privy to. It's not part of the stat pages that we read or any of that. And that's the training methods. These pitchers are not just training in the off season. They're not doing just weight training or throwing a lot. They're going to labs. There are labs where they're strapping nodes to these pitchers and they have all sorts of setups with all sorts of ways of measuring their, their arm angles and every muscle in the body is being watched and they are perfecting their pitching mechanics. They're bigger and stronger than players used to be. All you need to do is take a look at the average heights and weights of players going back two decades, three decades, four decades, and you will see that players now are much bigger, especially pitchers. Pitchers are groomed from a young age. When they have big kids now, they make them pitchers. The scouts like big, tall guys to be pitchers. They, they throw harder. So I think the, there's a lot of things that are contributing to pitchers throwing harder. I am in favor of trying out moving back the mound. Now, when that happens, if it does happen, if baseball tries that, and, uh, and I know that Theo Epstein, who now has this job in, the, in, the, in MLB's office, has been considering it, traditionalists, here's a good example of where traditionalism breaks down. Traditionalists will scream and yell, 60 feet, six inches came down you know, with Moses on Sinai, and, and you can't touch that. But we have to remember something about 60 feet, six inches. That wasn't always the distance. If you go back to the early days of baseball, they were playing with it. Why were they playing with it? Because they wanted to find the right balance where it's not too easy to hit and not too hard to hit. They were looking for the right balance. Well, if technology and, and, and other factors have, have created an imbalance where pitching is so, is so far ahead of hitting, that the, that the that that ba- that that balance that was achieved by 60 feet 6 inches no longer exists and we move the mound in order to reinstate the balance then we're actually preserving the purity of the game by moving the mound and the traditionalist who would refuse basically has their head in the sand and is allowing an imbalance to come into the game now uh, one more point on the moving of the mound if they choose to move the mound what we will expect to happen is not necessarily that the hitters can suddenly hit the fastballs better or only that. The main thing that will happen, my prediction, is a rise in walks. When the mound was, was lowered after 1968, the main statistical effect was a rise in walk rate. And that makes sense. Pitchers' pitches, especially their breaking stuff, is so carefully designed to cross the plate at a certain angle that if you move the height of the mound or if you move the mound back, then they're going to have to relearn all of their breaking pitches. And, and there's going to be, that's going to be a learning curve that I would, I would suspect it's going to lead to a rapid, a, a, a significant rise in walk rate, but I'm, I'm in favor of trying that. Since you're the baseball rabbi, um, do you sometimes focus on Jewish ball players? and their impact on the game. I mean, past and present, from Hank Greenberg, Sandy Koufax, to Max Fried. Um, do you think that, that Greenberg might have broken uh, Babe Ruth's home run record in 1938? I mean, do you, do you look at that as well? Uh, because, uh, you know, we're still looking, uh, you know, every uh, time spring training rolls around, uh, we all get emails uh, about the, the new Jewish ball players. Uh, how do you look at it? It's interesting I think you ask naturally- that question. I, I think, a, go ahead, Scott. No, it's okay. I think that um, we actually have, in some ways, almost shied away from dealing with that only because we did not want our podcast to become a Jewish podcast per se. We wanted to expand our audience. Uh, in fact, even at the beginning, we questioned whether calling it the baseball rabbi was a good idea. In the end, I think it was a good idea because it gives us a sort of unique inequality there. But we didn't want people to think this was a Jewish podcast. I mean, we're very proud of being Jewish. But it wasn't something which we wanted to emphasize per se. It was about baseball and it should be open to all people. And in fact, many of our fans are not Jewish. That said, we do obviously uh, take a lot of pride in Jewish ball players. In fact, we interviewed Art Shamsky, a uh, Jewish Mets ball player last year. And actually, it was even less than last year. It was in the offseason. So we definitely take pride in it. And uh, sure, so guys like Hank Greenberg, are, I think it was the Hebrew Hammer, is that what they called him? He was uh, definitely someone that almost broke Babe Ruth's record that year. So uh, came close, but... Uh, Unfortunately, didn't play long enough to do much more than that, but uh, obviously a wonderful ball player. And I definitely am proud of Jewish ball players myself. You know, it's interesting. You know, my, for, 
I, I talked about how, you know, I've been so obsessed with baseball my whole life. And this may seem surprising, but like, even, you know, growing up, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the son of a rabbi, you know, and, and, you know, and I just, yeah, I'm very Jewish. It never interested me. Meaning I was never one of those, one of those Jews who felt a greater affinity for certain ballplayers because they were Jewish. I can't explain why. I just never, I, I think, I think the way to explain it is that for me, baseball was this fantasy world, this other reality uh, that, that I stepped into. It, you know, it has its own heroes and villains and plot lines and history and politics, but it's completely separated and has no impact on what we'll call the real world with its history and politics and heroes and villains. And to me, the fact that certain players were Jewish or whatever nationality they were meant absolutely nothing to me. And it's only now in, uh, in the last few decades since I moved to Israel, and especially in the, last, in the last decade or so, where we have the Israel national team making some noise at the World Baseball Classic, and now we have the Olympics coming up, that the whole aspect of Jewish players has become meaningful to me. Um, so it, 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 which is, which I, again, I'm just kind of analyzing myself. It's a little bit interesting, but it's not something we emphasize in our discussions at all. <laughs> Our podcast, and I hope that some of your listeners will try it out and go find a baseball rabbi podcast and listen to it. But it comes with a warning. There have been people who are sort of casual baseball fans who listen to our podcast, and it's just like it's too intense. Uh, it it is really for serious fans. On the other hand, I, I know many baseball fans, a number of our listeners who were casual baseball fans, and through listening to our podcast, kind of became converted uh, to becoming much more serious fans who are fans of analytics. Well, I'm going to put you through uh, one more intensive uh, question here or, or series of questions because we're coming to the end of end of our time. Although, let me add something about uh, Jews and baseball. I mean, I am in that, uh, uh, as, as I think you are, somewhat younger than me. I uh, was uh, in 1963, uh, the Sandy Koufax uh, sitting out Yom Kippur. Uh, was extremely important uh, to to a lot of folks in, in our generation um, for all kinds of reasons having very little to do with baseball. Um, so we do keep an eye on it. And I have noticed that there have been uh, over the last uh, dozen years or so, uh, really, I think an increasing number of, of Jewish ballplayers uh, who've, who've come into baseball, either in the high minors or in, in the major leagues. Okay, we even, have, gonna, an Israeli, we we even have an Israeli citizen now on the Orioles. Uh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And and it made it made big news around here in Washington area. Uh, of course, we can't let you go without a lightning round. So we're going to do this very quickly. Uh, we're looking for quick gut reactions based on your expertise and your memory, uh, your memories. So are you ready? Here we go. Mike Trout or Willie Mays? Willie Mays. Willie Mays. I think Willie Mays is the greatest player of all time. He is. I think the Mike Trout is on the road to becoming Mickey Mantle, not Willie Mays. I've said that on the podcast. And, and I recommend that you go into our the library of our podcast and find the episode where we discuss Willie Mays' greatness in detail. Uh, Derek Jeter or Cal Ripken Jr.? Cal Ripken Jr. That was fast. <laughs> I'm not a Jeter fan. <laughs> yeah, Cal Ripken Jr. Right, we've talked about Kari Skramski, but we'll do this because Mickey Mantle is, is my most uh, you know favorite player of all time. Carl Skramski or Mickey Mantle? Mickey Mantle. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to take this away from Pesa. I, I, I love Carly Shemsky, my favorite player. Mickey Mantle is one of the top 10 players of all time. Yaz is not. Uh, Jacob deGrom or Pedro Martinez? Ooh. Ooh. Hold on a second. I, I, um, I would say Pedro, Pedro only because he did it for longer, Pedro. but the jury's still out. We'll have to see how deGrom yeah, does over the year. Best pitcher in today's game? Jacob deGrom. Jacob DeGrom. Uh, best hitter today. You want to see Otani Pesach? <laughs> Ooh, no, he's not the best yeah. hitter. He's the most. He's the he's, most entertaining, he's most entertaining hitter, and he's, right. and, he's, and he's great. Who's the best hitter in today's game? Hold on a second. Look, when he's healthy, um, unfortunately, he's, he's injured right now. But Mike Trout, uh, most underrated player in the game uh, today. Today, that's an interesting question. Most underrated player in the game. Hold on, hold on. Give me a second. Oh, that's a, such a good question. We can go back that's to that. Good... We'll go back to that. I'll yeah, let's go, ba let's go back. Let's go back we'll, to that. Will Barry Bonds make the Hall of Fame? What about Roger Clemens? Should they or will they? Uh, no, will they? 
I doubt it. No, they will not. Okay, and here, this is a this is a tough one. Fenway Park or the new Yankee Stadium? And what about the old Yankee Stadium? Fenway Park over both of them. I'm from Boston. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I disagree. I mean, Fenway Park is a thrill to go to in terms of history, but it has some of the worst sight lines of any ballpark in the major leagues. There's many, many places in Fenway Park where you where you just can't see whole swaths of the field. And uh, it, it's not the greatest fan experience. And I've been to both old and new Yankee Stadium, and they're both better places to watch a game. Fenway Park. <laughs> Got you. I, that, was a, that was an assumption I had made, Scott. <laughs> All right, we'll come back another time for the underrated player. The Baseball Rabbi Podcast with Pesach Wilicki and Scott Kahn is available wherever you get your podcasts. Pesach and Scott, we truly appreciate your joining us and talking all things baseball today. It's not every day that I get to speak with baseball rabbis, so thank you. Thank you, Dan. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. This is great. Well, if you're looking for more of our diverse content, visit our website, theneighborhood.org, to listen to all of our conversations, podcasts, and live interviews. And thanks to Pesach Walicki and Scott Kahn of the Baseball Rabbi Podcast for joining me today. And as always, thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, make sure you never miss an episode by tapping the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. I'm your host, Dan Mariashin. Talk to you again soon.